Yes, that's worth applauding for and praising God for. We had uh, three, three weeks of EBS, two here and one on one North Aurora campus last week, and God did remarkable things, close to 900 kids across three weeks and many, many volunteers. We, we, yeah, amazing. We had dinner last night with a couple, uh, and uh, she was, she's a grandmother. She said she had her two grandsons, and she volunteered for EBS. She said, I, I realized it wore me out. She said, I almost, it almost put me, you know, uh, laid me up for a week after that. But she said it was the best week, just serving and, and seeing God work in that way. And so, our, and you saw the cake in the face there. That was the one time the boys actually won. If you don't know, they have a competition, boys and girls giving money for a cause. And the girls always outgive the boys. But we put on video the one time in the last several years that the boys actually won. So, um, and then Miss Becky or Andrew gets to put the cake in the face. Speaking of giving, you know, if you've been around that our, our, our project with uh, this, this summer with VBS partnering with our kids has been to support Cure. Cure is a remarkable ministry putting first world hospitals in developing countries. Our goal is to raise $150,000 to give away to Cure to help outfit a new surgical center and pay the salary of a surgeon for a year who come and serve there and train other doctors. Uh, I just, last week we were um, a little over 100,000 and in one week, just I am thrilled to praise God and thank you and tell you you've given over $240,000. So <laughs> praise God for that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if you're wondering, well, what happens to that extra money? Uh, you can still give uh, to, to uh, serve the world and all the money above and beyond that $150,000, you know, doesn't go to me. It doesn't go to, uh, uh, it goes to give away to our other serve the world partners who are also doing remarkable ministry. One of my favorite things is to tell you the stories of what your generosity does. And we don't want you to feel guilty or pressured or obligated to give, but excited. It's an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing because everything we have is a gift of his grace. And so I wanna say thank you for being partners with us for what God is doing here and around the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the way you pour out your grace in our lives. We've been singing about it and we often forget it or lose sight that nothing that we have our life, our ability to breathe and walk and talk and love and be loved and work and all of it. We don't earn, you give it. So help us to see our lives that way and to joyfully give back to what you're doing in the world. Thank you for your word, which also is a gift to us. Open our minds and hearts that we might receive what you have for us this morning. We pray in your name, amen. If you've been tracking along with us, you know we're in a series on the book of Proverbs. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a collection of, of divine wisdom, sayings applied to life. Wisdom is not just a knowledge. Um, it's not sort of some guru thing. Wisdom is divine knowledge rightly applied to life circumstances. You know really smart people who are, do dumb things. Maybe some of you are sitting here. Or, 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 right? You know also people that you say, that person never achieved much intellectually, but they have wisdom. They seem to know how to live well. That's wisdom. The art of living well, applying God's divine wisdom and knowledge, his word, his truth, to our life circumstances in a way that helps us flourish. Relational circumstances, occupational circumstances. And so we've been looking at God's wisdom applied to different things. Friendship and temptation this week and work life. And so we talk about temptation, wisdom and temptation. I don't know what kinds of things tempt you. One of my great struggles in my life is ice cream. <laughs> you laugh, but it's an issue. I've worked hard to fight this temptation. Particularly mint chocolate chip, but even more, more recently, in recent years, coffee flavored ice cream. I have a serious issue. Uh, it's not that I go out and buy it if it's not, well, sometimes I do. <laughs> but it, like if it's in the house, I'm powerless. If it's in the freezer, I, it's not during the day. Well, I probably would be if I wasn't so busy. But my point is, at night, when I'm home, I can hear it calling from the freezer. <laughs> I know it's in there. And my wife will put it behind things so that I'm not as tempted, but I still know where it is. I still hear its voice calling to me. Jeff, java chip, coffee bean, right? Uh. <laughs> I'm working at it. You might laugh, well, okay, all right, calories, sugar, okay. What about more serious temptations? What does God's wisdom have to say to us about other things that would take us off track or derail our lives? 
Most of the book of Proverbs is a collection of wisdom on a wide array of topics. And so you've noticed in our sermons, we sort of uh, pick some of the sayings that apply to different issues and as a collection and round out the wisdom from different port- portions of Proverbs. What we're going to look at today is a chapter that's really a narrative, one of the few narrative chapters in Proverbs. The whole chapter is dealing with this subject, temptation. And it's a story told about temptation, a particular kind of temptation, but really we should understand Proverbs 7 as an anatomy of how temptation works, of any kind. What are its tactics? How do we deal with it? That's the story being told. It's told from the perspective of an older, wiser person, which is all of the book of Proverbs, watching a scenario in which a younger person is being led astray. And they have something, to say to, have something to say to us today, regardless of your age. So let's look at Proverbs 7, verses 1 through 5. We'll walk through the whole chapter today. This morning when you leave, you'll be experts in Proverbs 7. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman. From the adulteress with her smooth words. Do you think of God's word as the apple of your eye? Do you think of God's laws and commandments and rules as treasured and precious and an intimate friend? Or as sort of the, uh, you know, the obligatory, I should know this, I should do this. So there's this, uh, go back to that slide if you would please. Treasure up my commandments with you and keep them and live Life is in the word of God. This is the path, the way of life. We're going to come back to this idea in a few minutes, but keeping the word of God close, close to your mind, close to your heart, close at all times. Insight, understanding, discernment from the word of God is the best safeguard against temptation. Okay, the first thing to look at here is the context of temptation. Three points. They all start with C. I'm so excited. The context of temptation. After the admonition to keep the word of God close, Solomon, the author, is going to talk about, he's going to set the scene in which this temptation takes place. Look at verses 6 through 9. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I've seen among the simple, I've perceived among the youths, a man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight and the evening at the time of night and darkness. What a description. Psalm is looking out the window, looking down on on the street. It's, It's getting dark, it's getting late, and he sees among the youth out there someone who lacks sense. That's a phrase that could easily have described me at various times in my life. I'd like to say it's all in the past. Can you think of yourself at 15? You remember yourself back at 15? Anybody? Too far? 25? 35? Think of yourself as a 15, 18, 20-year-old. Were you more foolish then than you are now? I was, right? What about at 35? Those of you who are older like me, or were you more foolish then than you are now? What does that imply? Someday, you will look back on yourself now, at whatever age you are, and think, oh, what a fool I was. You are presently, where you sit, a fool to your future self. Right? The, the goal is not to be, is just don't, don't be the same kind of fool at 15, at 25, at 35, at 45, and so on. That we grow. But we're always going to look back and think, oh, so it doesn't matter the age. It's not just for the young. For all of us, Solomon looks out and he sees someone lacking sense. Not yet a fool. We talked about the wisdom and foolishness a few weeks ago, but well on his way. The whole scene is told from this perspective. I think one of the reasons it's told this way is that it's easier for us to see the danger other people are headed into than our own. Isn't that true? How often have you looked at a friend that you care deeply about and thought, this is not a good idea. The decisions you're making, the way you're heading with your life is not going to end well. And you're thinking about and praying, but how do I tell them? How do I let them know? It's always easier to see somebody else's vulnerabilities and dangers than our own. And the story's told this way so that when we're the person down on the street, we might have divine, the perspective of divine wisdom. We might remember God's perspective and do better. Now, 
First of all, verses eight and nine, we're told that he's in the wrong place. I don't know if you caught this or not. Yeah, there we go. I have looked out to my lattice and seen among the simple. I perceived among the youth, the youths, a young man lacking sense. Near her corner, the road to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. You see the, see the progression? It's night, it's evening, sun setting, now it's full darkness. He shouldn't even be there. We're gonna find out who this is near her corner, the road to her house at night as it gets dark. He's headed for trouble, doesn't even know it. The point is this, you might say, well, I'm not looking for trouble, I'm not looking for temptation, but here's the question, are you not, not looking for it? Are you actively seeking to avoid it? We rationalize, well, this isn't sinful. This isn't, I mean, come on, this isn't a problem. But is it helpful? Is it wise? Is it good for you? He shouldn't even be there. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, Jesus teaches us, lead us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Wisdom means looking to actively avoid the places and circumstances and activities and people that would tempt us, lead us away from the path God has for us. To make it more practical, late at night, scrolling on your phone, what are you, what are you exposing your mind to? Now, I could tell you lots of stories as a pastor of, of people who have taken missteps in this area, and I could tell you about people I know, but I don't have to. I can tell you about my own life about my own temptations and struggles of what I allow into my mind and into my heart. And you can tell you, you have your own stories. It shouldn't even be there. It shouldn't even be doing that. He has not yet given in, but he's headed for trouble. That's the point here. Wisdom means looking to avoid these things. Proverbs 6, verses 27 through 28. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? You've heard the phrase, she's, or he's playing with fire. You know that comes from Proverbs. There's, there's a kind of a, um, a gravitational power with temptation. Like, like the further you are distance, uh, gravity works both mass and distance, right? The further you are from the object, the the the, the less the power of gravity, the less the force of gravity has on you. The closer you are, the greater the attractional pull. That's, there's a spiritual principle at work there too. Like, okay, he's not looking for trouble, so he says. But why is he there? The, the, the possibility, the power, the attraction, the pull is greater the closer you are to that thing, to that person, to that activity. Conversely, the further you are, from whatever it is, the further you, the more you avoid it and stay, keep your distance from it. Think about what we see on our phones, right? The more you, and I, I, the more you scroll, the more you look, the more the algorithm gives you more of the same, and the greater the attraction, the pull sucking you in. The more you avoid it, put safeguards around it, say I'm not going to do that, ask for accountability. The less, and on and on, and on it goes. Look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17. I love this passage. There's a lot of wisdom for us here. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Two competing desires in us, flesh and Spirit. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things, what? You want to do. You think he'd write, you don't want to do. But do you see what he's saying? This is Romans chapter seven, which you can go and read uh, on your own. Some of you might know that passage. Paul talks about this struggle. I have desires, things I know are not pleasing to God, that, I, that is a part of me that wants to resist, but there's also a part of me that wants to do them, that wants to give in, that wants to go there. And Paul is saying, the more you walk by the Spirit, the more you put these things in place in your life and guard your mind with the Word of God, the less power and control to keep you from doing those things that the sinful part of you wants to do, the flesh. Now, there's an important contrast here. I know none of us can avoid all temptation entirely, but we make ourselves less susceptible 
when we walk by the Spirit. Martin Luther uh, famously said, um, you cannot stop the birds from flying above your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> I thought about that phrase when my wife likes to go for long walks outside, and in June and early July, you know, you know what the red-winged blackbirds are doing? Dive bombing people, particularly my wife. Uh, you know, coming at them from behind. So you can, you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. The point is do those things which make it less likely for you to give in. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. You, you knew that he would have something to say about this, as, and he does, from his classic work, Mere Christianity. Listen carefully to what he says. No man knows how bad he is till he's tried very hard to be good. A silly idea that's current today is that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. We never find out the strength of an evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. We tend to think of Jesus, well, he's different. He's the son of God. This is an issue for him. He's not. No, he knows better than you. And that's, we'll come back to that later. No person knows how bad they truly are until you work hard to be good. We don't achieve goodness by our hard work, but that doesn't mean there's no effort involved in following God. This brings us to the content of temptation. So the context is, what's he doing there on the street, near her corner, at night? Don't go there. This is a bad idea, looking down through the lattice, right? Hey, idiot, go the other way. But here's the content. Verses 10 through 15. And behold, the woman meets him. Now, but let me just pause here. Some of you, this is not, uh, some people have objected to this, like, oh, so of course it's the woman who's sinful and, and it's, 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 uh, you know, it's somehow misogynistic or disparaging of the genders. Actually, no, because in chapter eight, there's the call of divine wisdom, the call of righteousness. Do you know how that's personified? As a woman's voice. The whole point is just two competing voices, temptation and wisdom. They're both personified as female. It's not, it has nothing to do really with the gender. They're just giving us a personification and a case study of how temptation works, in case you were worried. And if you weren't, back to the text. <laughs> and behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. Listen, listen, by the way, to how the senses are involved in this. How she's dressed, what he sees. Wily of heart. She is loud, what he hears, wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market. At every corner she lies in wait. In other words, like, there's, there are pitfalls everywhere. She seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I've paid my vows. So now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I've found you. I've spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. That doesn't sound great to me, but apparently that was attractive then. <laughs> come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. She seizes him and kisses him. Pastor Brian tells a story about his father, Roland, who's passed away now, is with Jesus, but he was a pastor for many years. So he was at a diner on a cross-country trip, and this attractive young waitress kept looking at him, and he said, I've heard about men having their moment of temptation. Maybe this is my moment. She kept smiling and looking at him, and then she said she turned and walked straight across the room right to him, and he thought, oh, no, Lord, please give me strength. And she said, I suppose you've noticed that I've been looking at you. He said, uh-huh. She said, I just can't help but you look just like my grandfather. <laughs> that, thank you, Lord. <laughs> so here we see the tactics of temptation at work. She lies in wait everywhere, looking for a weakness to exploit. You, you, we need a certain vigilance in our spiritual lives. That doesn't mean paranoia, the devil behind every rock or something, but a, an alertness. An awareness of our own vulnerabilities. I need that more than I know. We were talking at our preaching team meeting and Pastor Brian said, you know, part of the Christian life, a big part of it is just learning to pay attention. Just learning to wake up and pay attention to what's going on in here and out there. To know where I'm weak. 
In verses 13 through 15, she actually offers a kind of religious justification. Did you catch that? We'll go back to that for just a minute. Whoop. I've had to offer sacrifices, and today I've paid my vows and come out to meet you. What does that mean? It's a, it's a rationalization. I've, I've, you know, I'm a spiritual person. God wants us to be happy. And, and there's an appeal to his vanity. I've come out to meet you, and I found you. It's about you. She makes the temptation personal. And then in verses 16 through 18, you can go there real quick. I've spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us fill, take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. She finally just says, you see the senses? What he hears, what he sees, what he tastes or kisses and touch. It's overwhelming. The fantasy comes to full form. Let's just come away with me. Come on. Let's just enjoy it. And in case there's any part of him that's still resisting, like, what if, what happens if it's found out? Verses 19 through 20. For my husband's not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. He will, at full moon, he will, full moon, he will come home. Nobody will know. It's just us. Nobody will ever know. You, you'll, we'll get away with it, in other words. It'll just be our secret. That's always a lie. By the way, the word for husband here is the Hebrew word ish, which just means man. There's a little interesting thing we should be missing. She's not really saying my husband. She says literally, well, the man's not even here. How disrespectful. Like, he's not even, don't worry about him. It's not even here. No one will know. What would you do if you were certain no one would ever know? How would you live if you, if you knew you could get away with it? It's always a lie. Always a lie. Luke chapter 8, verse 17, for all that is secret will be eventually brought into the light. Everything hidden will be brought in the open and made known to all. You're not as clever as you think you are. First of all, people know way more. Those that love you and are closest to you, they know what's going on with you more than you think. Second, God always sees and knows all. You might even deceive yourself but never him. We're not as good at hiding things as we think. It's always a lie. Do you see what's happening here? She appeals to him. Now, I don't know if, you, if this, how this connects with you, but the vulnerabilities, maybe the, I remember talking to a man who said, well, God wants us to be happy, right? I said, well, kind of. He said, look, I, I have not been happy in my marriage for years. Is this some religious, rational justification of what he wanted to do? Or maybe to flip it around, my husband is so unavailable emotionally. He's absent. He's a jerk. I, I've been lonely. Think of the rationalization that goes on in your mind, in your heart, for whatever the issue is. Then we look here, finally. I might... It, it's tempting almost to feel that this badly for this guy. And you could read this and think, well, the poor young guy, he's set up. No, no. Sin is always a choice. It's a choice to go near her corner. It's a choice to be there at night. It's a choice to listen to her, to her invitations. And it's a choice to go with her. Look at chapter, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by his or her own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. No, as a Christian, you don't get to say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, it wasn't my fault. Well, you don't understand. There were extenuating circumstances. Yeah, okay. You still have a choice to make. This brings us to the consequences of temptation. The consequences. We see that uh, in James verse 15, chapter 1 verse 15, it says that you're led astray by your own desire. Desire, when it's full grown, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. There's a progression here that leads to death. This is the primary consequence of sin always. Look at uh, verses 21 through 23. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. Do you notice this phrase here? 
all at once. All at once he follows her. It sounds so sudden and dramatic, but actually we know it didn't happen all at once, did it? He's been inching his way toward the precipice. He's been slowly making his way to where he's just like, he's, he's ready to fall. And yes, the actual fall happens all at once. You, have you ever th found out somebody did something terrible and you thought, how could they, I thought, how could he, how could she do that? Or maybe you thought about yourself. How did I get here? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? It's the little choices that are, that are, that are sometimes invisible, imperceptible, little inching away. Shouldn't be in that place. Shouldn't be watching that. Shouldn't be, making, shouldn't be Facebooking, you know, messaging with that person. You're setting yourself up. And then all at once, yeah, something unthinkable happens, which would have been unthinkable had you not made those choices. It sounds so sudden, but it isn't. The choices you make today have profound impact on the decisions you will make tomorrow. The things you allow into your life today, the people you surround yourself with today, what you watch and see and hear and do is all strengthening or weakening you for decisions tomorrow. You might say, well, you, but Jesus hung out with sinners. Yes, he did, and so should we. But they weren't the primary influencers of his decision making. He was influencing them. And the consequences we see are dire. As an ox goes to the slaughter. What a chilling phrase. As a stag caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. That's where it's headed. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, some of you know this, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin always leads to death. Death of relationships, death of your soul, death of your spiritual vitality, always. We know this from our study of Genesis a few months ago, Genesis 3, right? Death enters the picture. Look at verses 24 through 27, because Solomon bookends this, this tragic scene of temptation with wisdom about how to avoid it again. And now, O oh, sons, remember how it began with son? And now he says sons in the plural. I think that's, it, it, is, a, it is a wisdom applied to young people in general, but also I think there's something here for us in terms of you're not meant to walk the path and resisting temptation by yourself. We need a community around us. You need other believers. And now my sons, listen to me and be attentive, pay attention to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart, there, that phrase heart, turn aside to her ways. Do not stray to her paths. There's an internal and external motivation going on here. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Let not your heart. Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a person, to a man, but in the end, it's the way of death. It seems right. It feels right. It looks good. Other people are telling me this is a good idea. But in the end, it leads to destruction. As followers of Jesus, we know and we believe that not everything that we want to do is good for us. Not everything that looks and seems and uh, right to the world is, is right in God's eyes. Solomon says, listen up, guard your heart. How? Through his word. Through the word of God. Look at verses 24 through 27 once more. Listen to me. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. If we flip ahead now to Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. I had my boys memorize this when they were little. How can a young man keep his way pure, or a young woman for that matter? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart. Why? So I can be impressive with my biblical knowledge? So people think, wow, like I memorize the scripture? That I might not sin against you by guarding your heart according to his word. 
So friends, pay attention to your life what you watch, who you're with, what you listen to, where you go. Amy Carmichael wrote this. She said, all the great temptations appear first in the region of the mind and can be fought and conquered there. We have been given the power to close the door of the mind. We can lose this power through disuse or increase by its use. By the daily discipline of the inner man in things which seem small and by reliance upon the word of the spirit of truth. Hear what she's saying? It begins in here, what you're thinking about. Fill your mind with the things of God. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, okay, but who actually can live this way? I mean, nobody's perfect. I mean, who can, who can avoid everything, every temptation? It seems impossible. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, that no temptation has seized you, has overtaken you, except that is common to man. You're not the only one. You're not special. We all face these things, he's saying. And God, he, God, will not let you be tempted beyond what, you, what is your ability to bear. Now, some people twist this verse and say, God will never give you more than you can handle. By the way, that is not a verse anywhere in the Bible. All of life is more than I can handle. I don't know about you. <laughs> He's given me more than I can handle. The verse is, temptation to sin is no excuse to sin. God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, what you can handle. And he will give you a way to stand up or uh, to escape from it. What's the way? We've been talking about the way, his word, Christian community, wise living, but ultimately speaking, the way he's already given us. Look at Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. We'll finish with this verse. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. The way God has given us is Jesus. He's the way out. He's the way of escape. When, so the point of this is run to him. And some of you sitting here right now, I've been pastoring long enough to know there are people in this room who are just like that young man lacking sense. You are vulnerable. You are making foolish decisions. You are headed for trouble. And you think nobody knows. But God sees. And he's not waiting to get you. He's saying, Turn around, run to me. There is a way out. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for the truth of your word. We need it more than we know. And all of us allow things into our lives that would lead us astray. All of us are more vulnerable than we want to admit. But all of us have a way out. And it's you, Jesus. So teach us to remember and to believe and to trust that there is nothing we can face that you haven't faced, that you can't overcome. And there is no mistake that you can't forgive. Help us to run to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. I love singing that song. I love hearing Ricky sing it as well because it's really true. In Jesus alone is there protection and redemption from sin. Brothers and sisters, May the fellowship of the Spirit and the love of the Father and the grace of the Son fill you and be with you now and forever. Go in his peace.